sameness. And we uh, would say that God has created things um, that are true, that are from him, to be superior to others. That's why even in our passage today, Micah chapter 7, verse 18, who is like our God? It's a rhetorical question. No one is like our God. Our God is above all, not equal. This is kind of a sub-point, almost similar, but I think slightly different, that all religions are true. Because all religions are equal, they think that all religions are true. That means you can hold a, a, a view of a Hinduism, a, hin, a view of, of Buddhism, and a view of Christianity, and they're all true. Like I said before, they all contain truth. Every single religion contains truth. Why? It's because religion was made by man, and man has truth in them because they were made in the image of God. So there are good things in other religions, but that doesn't mean that they're all true, right? Um, if I, This happens to me all the time when I, when I put together things. I'm not the fix-it guy. You all, you all know this. Um, I remember the first time I had to put together a child's crib. You know, you're a new dad, and your wife's pregnant, and you're putting together a child's crib, and it, it is, it's like war with the crib, right? I mean, <laughs> things just don't work, and you put it together, and you, you put it together the wrong way. One piece is in the wrong place. You've got to take it back apart, or the, the thing, the door, they don't do this now because it's now dangerous for children, but the, the bar wouldn't go down, and all these things, because you had one piece wrong. If you have one piece in the wrong place, the whole thing doesn't work right. And that's kind of like other religions. You may have a lot of the right pieces, but they're not put in the right place. They're not, they're not true. So even though that you may have some things that are true that kind of work, in reality, they're not true according to God's word. The other kind of spirit of the age is that everyone kind of wants their own personal Jesus, meaning that they don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible. They believe in the Jesus that they want their... Um, that they want Jesus to be. So what I mean is, is that you have people who say that Jesus was the greatest feminist in the world, right? Jesus believed in feminism, right? Not feminism in, in terms of our Christian worldview, but fe- feminism in terms of, the, of a secular worldview. Uh, people would say that Jesus was the greatest um, liberator, uh, all about liberation theology. He was all about serving and liberating countries from communism, Right? So if you believe and follow Jesus, that you should believe in liberation of all society to become, a, to become a free, capitalistic, democratic society. Some people would say that Jesus was all about social activism, that Jesus, if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to be caring for, for, for act, being active in, in social issues. That they take a couple ideas of Jesus, and rather getting the whole picture, they kind of overemphasize one aspect of his character and expand that. That is the wisdom of the age. What Paul's saying here is we're not speaking with the wisdom of the age, right? Because what does he say? Those, the wisdom of the age, the people who say those kind of things, are, do, are what's going to happen. They are doomed to pass away. The truth of God's word will always last. But the worldly philosophies will not um, last. They will fall apart. I've been reading this a lot lately, and I'm not sure if it's just me uh, coming across it, or I'm just maybe more aware of it. Um, but I do think that America is on, on decline, right? If you look at the, the, the history of power, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but you look at the history of power, it is impossible for countries to maintain power. Every great dynasty, every great country has a collapse, right? You have the United, you know, you know, USSR, world power is now non-existent, right? You had the, the empire of Greece, the empire of Persia, all those empires are no longer in existence. Why? Because the power doesn't last. America is once the greatest nation in the world, and America is still a great nation, but it's in decline, right? And who knows when, when, when America's wisdom of the age will pass away. There is no guarantee that America will last forever. The only country that's going to last forever is the, is, is the heavenly country that God has prepared for us in glory. I say that to say that the wisdom that I see happening in America is worldly philosophy, and it's going to pass away. It is doomed to pass away. It is not true. So we want to make sure that we're not building our lives on things that are false, but things that are true. So what is this truth? Paul continues to go on, verse 7. But we impart, and I think it's the same thing, we impart wisdom. What kind of wisdom do we impart? It says a secret and Hidden wisdom. The word secret there is the same word we get for mystery, mysterion, uh, in the Greek. That, that anytime you see mystery in the Bible, it's not 
um, things that we don't know. It's things that we used to not know, but now God has made known to us. So I, every time that is, that is talked about in the New Testament, that is always the gospel, right? It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We didn't know who Jesus Christ was. We didn't know how God was going to save, save us from our sins. But now we know that that person is Jesus Christ uh, from the smallest clans of, of Judah, the tribe, or the clans of Bethlehem, from the tribe of uh, clan of Judah to connect it with this morning's message. It says, but I, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom from God. Right? So this is wisdom not of the world. This wisdom comes down from God. Right? We, have to, we have inherited this wisdom from above. Now, we know that we have inherited that wisdom from God here. Right? God has, has spoken by the Holy Spirit, men, holy men carried upon by the Holy Spirit to write these words for us. And it says something very specific here. It says that which God decreed before the ages for our glory. What Paul is saying here is that God preordained and predestined our salvation before the foundations of the world. God set in motion that Jesus Christ would save us. Ephesians 1 says that we were adopted in him before the foundation of the world. God decreed it. You see that all over the Bible, right? God is in complete control of our universe. God knew that before he created Adam and Eve, he knew that Jesus Christ was going to come and pay for sins on the cross and be raised from the dead and years later return and usher in his, his eternal reign on the new heavens and the new earth. God ordained it before the foundation of the world. Now you ask yourself, why? If God preordained this, why did God allow sin in the world? Because we experienced that. In our congregation in recent days, we've experienced tragedy. Right? We've ex- experienced tragedy when uh, Jennifer Zills passed away in a car accident. Uh, we, we, we experienced tragedy of, 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 of loved ones going to be with the Lord. You know, we, we experienced tragedy and heartbreak, and we ask God, why does this happen? Why is there a fractional relationship? Why is, why is my, my body not feeling the way, the way it used to? Why, God? Why did you allow sin in the world? And, and sometimes we have to say, we don't know. We don't know why God has, has created the world the way he did. But we do know this, that we, he created it for his glory. And that we know that, that in, in some way that God redeeming a sinful and cursed people and a sinful and cursed world would bring him more glory in the end. That's what God is saying. That this way, the death and resurrection of my son to redeem all humanity, to reconcile all things under Christ, is the way that he gets the most glory. So we don't know how and why all that works out, but we know that it's true because it's in God's word. That's why it has happened. So it says here that God has decreed before the ages for our glory. For our glory, it says. It's crazy, isn't it? That that God has given us glory because we now share that glory with God. We will reign with Christ for all eternity. He's going to go on and share that in um, chapter 6, verse 8. It says, none of the rulers of this age understood this. And I think he's probably speaking specifically of Caiaphas and Pilate here. Uh, for if they had, it says, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Uh, some commentators would say this is the highest title that Paul gives uh, Jesus in all the epistles. The Lord of glory. But it says this Lord of glory, the one who had all glory, was what? Was crucified. Now these rulers did not understand the wisdom of, of God, so they, 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 they killed Jesus Christ, right? They crucified him on, on a cross. Well, we know the, the wisdom of God now, right? We know that Christ had to be crucified. He had to be rejected. He had to be forsaken and then rise again so that we would have that hope, right? Because that, that's how God solves his riddle, that God is compassionate slow to anger, that his anger is not going to be against us forever. Why? It's because he takes his wrath and he pours it upon his own son so that we can experience his favor and his, his pleasure. And then look at verse 9, as it is written. This is what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. I've always read this verse um, Probably until a couple of years ago, and I always thought that was that was that was present tense, right? That no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love Him. 
thinking that we can't really know what God has prepared for us. We can't really know what God has, has, has done for us in the future. But if you notice what the, the way the verse goes, look at verse 10. It says, these things God has revealed to us through his spirit. God has prepared us. He has revealed to us what's there for us. Not all the details, right? We wish we had more details of heaven, but not all the details, but a lot of them, right? That we get to, to be in, in God's presence where there's no more pain, there's no more crying, and there's no more death. We get to be gathered with all the saints throughout history, working for the Lord in his glory. Gathered around the throne, people from every tribe, tongue, and, and nation. We know that we are going to see Christ face to face, right? That's why I love that last, the song we sang this morning, I Will Glory in My Redeemer. That we get to, to, to think about seeing Jesus, right? To falling at his feet, to touching his now scarred hands and his, and his feet. God has revealed to us how? Through the Spirit. Everything that you're going to see here in the text, the only reason that we can know the gospel is because the Spirit of God has revealed it, right? The, the, the Spirit of God is the one who reveals these things for us. So number one, we want to glory in the, the Spirit's message. Number two, the glory of the Spirit's mind. The glory of the Spirit's mind. Look at verse 10 again. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. It's kind of a, a, a weird way of saying it. We know that the, the, the triune God that we serve, Father, Son, and Spirit, all are, are one. And it says the Spirit searches even the depths of of God, meaning that the Spirit reveals God to us, that He searches and figures out things that can be revealed to us. And of course, the Spirit knows all those things. And he's trying to draw things out for us. Verse 11, for, you, for who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We know this, men, don't we? We can't really get inside our wives' head. <laughs> what are they really thinking, right? Uh, we know this. You can't know what else somebody else is thinking unless they reveal it to you. Now, you could guess. You could have an observation based on past experience and, and facial expressions. But I look out there at, the, at, this, at this crowd tonight, and I have no idea what you're thinking. Some of you may be thinking, will he stop talking? Right? Some of you, man, this is excellent. Keep going, right? I have no idea. I just... I, I know what I, I think you think, um, at least what I put my, in, my own, in my own head. But that's what he's trying to say here. He says, no one can understand what, what's going on in a person unless the spirit of that man reveals it in, in a conversation. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm, I'm feeling. It's the same thing with the Lord. No one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Meaning, you can't know God unless the spirit makes him known to you. This is the idea of conversion, that we were dead in our sins, we were unable to know God, and God makes our, our dead hearts alive by the Spirit. He reveals the glory of God. This is why when we, when we preach the gospel, to some it's foolishness, and to others it is the wisdom of God. That only happens by the Spirit, right? Every week I try to make you feel sinful in the things that you're doing sinfully throughout the week, right? Right? I want to draw that out for you. I want you to look upon your sin of this past week, and then I want you to see that all that sin is cast into the depth of the sea. And I want you to marvel at the glory that what Christ has done for you, that he has taken all your sin upon the cross, that you will never bear any sin ever again because it has already been paid for. Right? How glorious is that? I don't want to make you look at your sin as being small. I want you to make your sin as looking big, and then I want you to see even how big the cross is in your life. That is the picture of the New Testament. Look at verse 12. It says, for now, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. So what we have now is we have the spirit of God that teaches, illumines, guides, and comforts us in the truth of God's word. So when we are confronted with the wisdom of the age, or the wisdom of God, we know what is true and right because the Spirit reveals that to us. You've had those moments when you've been maybe in a conversation and you're not exactly sure, but you're like, just something's not right here. Something's not right. When the Spirit reveals that in time. 
Well, we're going to look at here in a second in terms of how do we know that. It really comes down to the word, you know, uh, the word of, of God. Let me just finish here, verse 12. It says, but the spirit who is from God, that, the purpose, we might understand the things freely given us by God. What has God given us? God has given us himself, right? And through the spirit, he reveals to us what we really have in Christ. You know that great prayer that Paul has, that I pray that, that the saints would understand how wide the love of God is, how deep the love of God is. He wants us to know what God has given to us. And by the Spirit, he does that again and again. Now, how does the Lord do this? How does the Spirit reveal these things to us? Look at verse 13. It says, and we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Verse 13, and we impart. In God's economy, how God has chosen to give his, his word is through teachers, right? So there's two things there. We start with the word. First, what is being uh, taught? It's the word of God, right? We want to make sure that the Bible is taught in all our, uh, all the, 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 the life of our church, Sunday school, children's ministry, uh, our children's church, that, that when the kids leave, we want them to hear the word of God, which they did this, this, this day. Uh, we want that to happen in our, in our meetings that are happening upstairs right now with our college students, when we have college Bible studies, when we have when our seniors meet. We want the Bible to be everywhere. And God has given us tremendous teachers in this church. Right? There's, there's tremendous knowledge and wisdom in our Sunday school classes. And I'm, I'm talking from our seniors all the way up through our, uh, from our kids all the way up through our seniors. Right? God has given tremendous wisdom in our church. How, how great was it to, to have Lois Scott here? And, you know, she called me this week and she said, Pastor, you know, I just can't. I fell this past week and it was an accident, but I'm just worried that, you know, I'm going to fall again and I really need to be careful. And my kids have been begging me to stop driving 20 minutes from Fort Mill to, to park to teach Sunday school. I love it. I hate to, that I'm not going to do it, but I really think that they're right. I just, I just shouldn't do it. You know, I'm going to miss teaching. I've taught Sunday school for 70 years, right? And she just loves the Word of God. And how encouraging is it that we were able to celebrate that with her, right? To know that when she poured over her lesson on a, on a Friday night or on a Saturday morning, and she was able to teach God's Word to God's people. That is a beautiful thing. So can I encourage you, to those who are teachers of God's Word, to rejoice in that? Those of you who teach our kids, you're shaping the hearts and minds of our children. You are giving them God's Word, right? You are implanting the deep things of God in their heart by the, by the Spirit of God, that He has this kindling to work the truth in their life, right? I mean, it's amazing what happens when you teach God's Word. And God has given you that passion, right? Teaching kids is not lesser ministry, Right? You, are, you, you have the most precious thing in, in the eyes of God. You have the hearts of his children that you get to form, to nourish, and to cherish. What a blessed gift. And those of you who teach, teach, our, teach our adults, praise God for your faithfulness. Continue to labor, right? Week in and week out. I'm so thankful for Lindsay. And Lindsay will always tell you that he doesn't teach, he facilitates, right? But you teach, brother, right? You're, you're teaching God's word through, through facilitation, we'll call it. Teaching through facilitation. Praise God that when I first got here, um, I did a class on systematic theology. We read a, a giant book by Wayne Grudem, over uh, 1,500 pages, right? And uh, I did the class for 18 months, and there was only one person who never missed a class, Lindsay Waldrop, right? And me and Lindsay, went, we went toe-to-toe -to -toe a few times in that class, um, but he read 1,500 pages so that he could become a better Sunday school teacher, Right? That is the kind of maturity that we have in the life of our congregation. Praise God for it. That he brings teachers um, to teach others, right? That's why we, we read that great verse in Ephesians chapter 4, that he has given pastors and teachers to the local church to bless them, right? To encourage them that they can become mature in Christ. So one of the things that I want to do here is I want to have more of those teachers, 
right? Right now we have one pastor. I kind of alluded to it again this morning. But I pray that I'll lead you through a process on having multiple pastors who love God's word, who can model God's word, and who can teach God's word, right? I believe that the Lord has, has blessed me in the, with the ability to communicate and to teach, but I'm not the only voice that God's people should be hearing because I'm one man. But having a plurality of those people teaching and blessing God's word, blessing God's people through the word is, is powerful. So he, 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 the spirit imparts his wisdom through teachers who teach the word and then through prayer, right? All throughout this entire passage, what do you see? The spirit of God is the one who brings illumination. So unless the spirit of God rests upon your hearts, unless the spirit of God communicates this truth to you, I am wasting my breath. If we are not praying that God would speak through his word, then we are wasting our time as a congregation, right? But the reason why I love the way the Lord uh, uses his word is that we don't have to gimmick people or guilt people to follow Jesus. We share the word of God, and God, by the power of the Spirit, will convict hearts and draw men to himself. We lift high the name of Jesus, and God will draw them, right? Now, we want to be passionate about Christ. We want to implore people to come to the Lord. We want to compel, the Bible says, persuade, all that language. But we know the only reason that people choose to follow Jesus is because the Spirit has opened their eyes to the truth of the gospel. So that means that we are free to to be bold in our proclamation and know that God will bring fruit. But only if God wants to bring fruit. So we need to beg God to bring conversion. I think the reason why we don't see more growth in, in our church and in churches across America is because God's people just don't pray. To our shame. To my shame. We don't pray enough. I've said, that the, I've said this to you before. Paul Chu, pastor, pastor of the largest church in Korea, um, said that the difference between a Korean church and American church is that in an American church, you stay after to eat, and we stay after to pray. It's convicting, and probably there's a lot of truth to that. Nothing wrong with a good fellowship. Don't get me wrong, right? Um, Please, please, let's keep having fellowships, but let's keep having prayer. If I said, okay, guys, we're not not going to hear the word of God tonight. We're just going to pray. Let's see who comes. You know, we've had a couple of those, and usually those are coming, you know, few and far between, you know. The, the, the church does not care as much about the word, does not care much about the Lord. Uh, and that is revealed in, in the lack of our prayer life, right? But just what if? What if we prayed? What if we called down God to, to bring conversion, to bring spiritual life in the heart of our congregation, right? What if we did that? What if we just fasted and prayed that God would move, that eyes would be opened? Don't get me wrong, I think God is already moving in the life of our church, right? There's no reason why we have five rows of college students. No reason outside of the Spirit of God, right? We preach the Word and we love people, amen, but it's the Spirit of God that has brought those folks here. It's no no logical sense that would make it happen. But what if we would continue to pray that God would do something in our midst that we wouldn't believe, right? And that's even coming in Habakkuk, right? Habakkuk chapter 2 says that you would not, there's there's something going to happen that you would not believe even if you were told. That's the Spirit's method. The Spirit must move. Well, lastly, let me close here in verse 14. Just kind of reiterate that point. It says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. If you are living in the flesh, it's hard for you to understand the things of the Spirit. And the, the, the entertainment that... Um, the American church is consuming is making them very weak spiritually, right? They're being filled with carnality week in and week out, and they are not able to, to, to hear the Spirit of God, right? Now, the Spirit of God will, will, will work to them, but we have to be spiritual people if we are going to hear spiritual things. And I think that we have to, 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 to we want to dive deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the text of Scripture, but there's so much out there that is vying for our time and attention that I think that there's more natural people in churches than, than spiritual people. 
So the word of God doesn't affect our hearts as much as it, it could uh, because we're not prepared a week in and week out as we, when we gather. But very, very, the one who does not know Jesus is the natural person. And that is everybody who is born. Everybody who is born is natural. The natural person has desires that are set against God. And their heart must be transformed by the Spirit. And we believe that happens. That happened to all of us in conversion. We must be born again. When we, when we first believed upon Christ, we were born again. Let me just say this. There is not two kinds of um, Christians here. Some uh, groups have taken this passage out of context. Um, I think maybe common day Pentecostals will do this. They'll say that you have to have two experiences, that you make the initial decision of Christ, and then you get born again by the Spirit, right? You have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, when you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit makes you alive. You have the Holy Spirit living in you, right? Now, you may not see everything because you're young or your, your eyes aren't focused on, on the Lord uh, in certain ways, but there is no second giving of the Spirit, right? There is the giving of the Holy Spirit at conversion, and you are baptized then, and you are sealed until the day of redemption, right? And then you can understand the things of God, because you wouldn't even believe in, in Christ if it wasn't for the Spirit. It makes no sense in the natural world, but in the spiritual world, it makes all the sense. Let me close with this, the glory of the Spirit's Messiah. The glory of the Spirit's Messiah. Isn't it amazing how good Jesus is to us? Uh, I am so encouraged uh, when I pray with some of you. Uh, the beginning of your prayer usually always begins with, I love you, Lord. Right? I love you, Lord Jesus. Look at verse 16. It says, for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? That's a quote from Isaiah 40, uh, 13. It's a wonderful uh, passage. Isaiah 40 to Isaiah 65 is just a wonderful um, calling of the, the glory of heaven. All these great prophecies. Um, but it's implied. Who, who, can, who can tell God what to do? <laughs> who has understood all that the Lord is doing? But then it says, but we have the mind of Christ. So Jesus didn't just die for us. He didn't just, he wasn't just raised for us. But he actually sent the Spirit of God in us to give us his mind of how to think and how to live in this world. Absolutely fascinating that God himself, maybe this is one of the reasons why that he had to declare this from, from time, from age, before the, the world uh, began, is that he wanted us to have the mind of Christ, to have God actually dwelling inside of us by the power of the Spirit. So we know God. God is intimate and God is personal. We know God. Why? It's because God became one of us. He became our Emmanuel, God with us. So we have his mind. So if we open his word and we pray and we ask the Spirit to reveal things to us, we know what Christ Jesus would want us to do. We know how he would want to want us to live and how he would want our um, how to direct us in the choices in this world. So I, I think as, as a takeaway, church, we, we don't want to be naturally minded. We want to be spiritually minded. And I think, how do we do that? Uh, I think that we have to take a good, hard look at our lives and ask ourselves, am I being more natural or more spiritually minded? And then make those changes in your own life, but then bring people along with you. Because remember, that the, the purpose of the church is not just that you would be kept safe. That's part of the job, is that you would be kept safe in Christ, that you would guard the good deposit that has been entrusted to you. But it's also that you would help others guard the good deposit, that you'd help others not be natural but be, be spiritual. We're all called to be, come, come together in this, that the Spirit of God would open our eyes, that we would live differently in this world. So if you think people in this church are living more spiritually minded than you, hang out with them. Sometimes the best thing you can do for your Christian walk is to hang out with people who are more heavenly minded than yourself. And when you do that, you become more heavenly minded. But if you hang out with people who are carnal, you will become more carnal. This is why it's so important for us and the life of a church that we would all be spiritually minded. Here's why. 
All of us are going to be around each other a lot. We are going to be each other's best friends, right? We're going to hang out with each other all the time. If you have children, our children are going to hang out with each other. And if we have a carnal home, guess what? That carnality is going to be passed on to other children in our church, right? We really are battling with eternity here every single week. Heaven and hell hangs in the balance. And we know that the only way that people can come to Christ is through the Spirit of God, that we want to make sure that we are living by the Spirit week in and week out so that people in our lives can see the Spirit, that we can see the Spirit and help others find the Spirit of Christ. Because we have this wisdom from God that God decreed before the ages for our glory, that one day that we would... Uh, leave this world and be united with God in his presence forevermore. We praise God for Christ. Let's pray in his name. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who, who sanctifies, who transforms us uh, by his grace. Oh God, I pray that we would not be um, carnal Christians, that we would not be naturally minded, God. We know that the natural mind cannot understand the spirit of God. And we know in this passage, God, the natural man is those who are lost. But God, we don't want to live... Uh, as those who have been born again and yet full of the world. So, God, I pray that you would convict our own hearts. God, that you would give us the discipline to practice new routines and new habits to, to change um, our, our mindset, that we would be taught by the Spirit. So, God, I pray that all those who are here, that we would be taught by your Spirit to, to rest in your Word uh, to make more time for prayer, to make more time for, for fellowship of the saints, God, uh, that we would help others be uh, move closer and closer uh, to a, a, a deeper walk with you. So, God, I thank you so much for this body. I thank you so much for your kindness uh, that you have um, given us. I pray, God, as we leave this place, that we would leave in grace. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.